Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. 
O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to dead and who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. 
He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written, not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believed in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Christ the King. This morning, I wondered if you have a cross. Today, I brought some to, some to show you. I have this cross bookmark that keeps my page. I have a cross necklace. And I have this cross decoration that my kids made. We have some other decorations in our house, too, that are crosses. We've got t-shirts that have crosses on them. And we have some other jewelry. I'm sure that you've seen crosses, too. If you don't have any in your home, maybe you've seen some at church or other places. Crosses are a great reminder of church, God, and Jesus' love. Today we are reminded, though, in our lesson that crosses are so much more than just decorations and jewelry. Crosses really mean that we should follow Jesus. In our lesson today, Jesus tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. So I wondered if you can do that this week. I wondered if you can make a cross if you don't have one out of paper and keep it with you this week as a reminder to follow Jesus. So how do we do that? We are reminded to follow Jesus by listening to his teachings. We continue to learn more about God and to tell others about God too and to be kind and loving and to serve other people who need help. We can do this every day, and carrying a cross is a great reminder that Jesus died for us because he loves us and that we should follow him. Let us pray for this today. God, today we give you thanks and praise for Jesus. God, help us to remember to take a cross and follow Jesus. Help us to remember his teachings about you and help us to remember to love and serve others. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. If you wish to be my disciples, deny yourself, lose your life, pick up your cross, and follow me. 
Jesus' call to discipleship is quite radical, isn't it? And we know from this the path won't be easy, putting the needs of others first, serving those on the fringes. And such love in action will result in not glory, but suffering. So how many of us are just ready to wave their hand and answer Jesus' call? Like Peter, our minds are drawn to worldly opinions and values instead of the promises of the kingdom of God. The disciples witness astounding healings, decisive exorcisms, and surprising inclusion. And when the local leaders challenge Jesus, Jesus easily beats them in the debates. And although Peter professes Jesus as the Messiah, his shining moment fades away when he reacts to what Jesus has to tell him about what being the Messiah entails. How can this be that the Messiah will suffer, die, and rise again? How can it be? Now, ancient peoples expected that the long-awaited Messiah would deliver them from Roman oppression. Kingship, might, prestige, power, and dominion, well, all those things went with the reign of King David. Similarly, today, Christians are lured by the theology of glory, claiming that wealth, power, and status are signs of God's favor. But your God brought salvation in an unexpected way through the work of Jesus on the cross. God's strength is exposed in weakness and not in power. The new life that Jesus offers is disclosed in his death. Thus, those that work to save their lives will lose out. And those who put the good news of Jesus first experience eternity in a relationship with Jesus here and now and in heaven someday. Now Jesus teaches about the way of the cross in the shadows of Caesarea Philippi. And that backdrop says to people it's dominated by Rome and by cult worship. But the mission of Jesus is so countercultural to that. It's to breathe life into the suffering of the oppressed and the marginalized. And those worldly powers oppose his countercultural mission. Jesus' words and actions enact the kingdom of God wherever Jesus goes. But he speaks against the evil and the corruption, and that gets him in trouble. For calling out the powers that be will mean suffering for Jesus. So if we desire to truly follow Jesus, we have to take up our crosses and be like Jesus, speaking out against systems that oppress and dominate. Those that sacrifice their life, turning from a me focus to being God or other focused, are the ones that gain life. And this is truly living in a paradox. So here's an example. Francesco was born to a prosperous, prosperous silk merchant and an aristocrat. Well-educated in music and poetry, speaking French and Latin, leading a carefree, rich life, especially leaving school at the age of 14, leading a group of boys into merrymaking, often breaking the curfew. And his passion was to be a French knight because that meant archery, wrestling, and horsemanship. So he joined the forces. And after being ransomed from prison during the war, he had visions of God. He prayed. He visited lepers. He donated his treasures to the poor. And he even took his dad's expensive drapery and sold it for money, money to repair a church. So his father became angry and took him before the bishop. And here is where Francesco took a stand. He took off his clothes proclaiming that he was no longer the son of Pietro, but he was the son of his father in heaven. Wearing rags, he went into the woods and he left everything behind. St. Francis of Assisi embraced a life of poverty and service to the poor. He denied himself and took up his cross and he followed Jesus, thereby gaining the treasure of life with him. 
Likewise, Jesus invites all of us to set down our expectations, to give up our self-centeredness, and to pick up the cross of sacrificial life and faithful endurance. Like St. Francis, we can deny ourselves, giving up status or power, and embrace a new identity as a child of Jesus. My dear friends in Christ, each day God's Spirit molds us into the likeness of Jesus, preparing us for eternal life with God. God's love is shown in Jesus' work on the cross, bringing salvation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this, The cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark on discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. It meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. Jesus calls us to live beyond ourselves, loving and serving others. So knowing that Jesus' mission and purpose is to bring life out of this death, what does it look like for you? I've been thinking a lot about it this week, and I think it looks something like this. Living in biblical virtues and working for justice and peace, even when it's not the popular thing to do and meets the criticism of others. It looks like pointing out corruptness in systems and structures through something like the Stop Human Trafficking Initiative, anti-racism training, and advocating for our veterans. For young parents, it might look like giving up those luxury items until the children get older to attend to the children's needs. For some, it means donating to a charity or the annual campaign at the local church. As a member of a congregation, it looks like patient listening, seeing through the lens of another, gentle compromise, and sharing power for the common good. It looks like a church community not only proclaiming the good news of Jesus, but modeling his sacrificial love. My dear friends in Christ, Jesus teaches about the kingdom of heaven. And this threatened the powers that be. And the empire removed such threats to their control by crucifying the so-called rabble-rousers on the cross. But Jesus remained true to his mission of love, so Jesus needed to go to the cross. But God uses all things to God's glory. Without Jesus' crucifixion at Golgotha, the triumph of God would have not been made visible through the resurrection. Jesus' sacrificial death is an unmerited gift of grace, making you and me right with God. As God transforms the cross, a symbol of shame into a symbol of of glory. God's saving love for you is made visible on that cross. And God continues to use your carried crosses to show God's love to the rest of the world. Thanks be to God. Take up your cross.
with the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, for the world, and all those in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the wor earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over all the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death, revealed to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Restore, restore all who are sick or grieving. Today, we especially pray for Liz, Chris, Walt, Jan, Don, Anne, Sylvia, Christine, Joan, Amira, Ethan, Juanita, Mike, the grieving family of Jerry Zelm. We pray for those victims of human trafficking, those serving in the military, those who are incarcerated and their families. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Strengthen our ministry partners, Serenity Inn, Family Promise, Reformation Lutheran Church, Lutherdale Bible Camp, All God's Children, Mount Meru Coffee Project, and Outreach for Hope Congregations. We pray for the work of our global partners, the Evangelical Lutheran Churches in El Salvador and their Bishop Gomez, and in Tanzania and their Bishop Nasari. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. So wherever you go and whatever you do, share the love and the peace of Jesus. At this time, we receive our offering, and we thank you for the many ways that you contribute to the mission and ministries of Christ the King. And we thank so many who have already returned their pledge card as a symbol of your commitment to the mission going forward. Let us pray. 
Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times, in all places, give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant, my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. You may now receive communion in your homes. The body and blood of Christ are given for you. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. May God bless you to be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Some announcements before we part today. 
Be sure to join us next week, Sunday, March 7th, for the annual meeting at 1 o'clock. Also, check out the information that you received in the mail about our stewardship appeal, Growing in Generosity, inviting you to take part in the new thing that God is doing here at Christ the King. So take some time to read that and prayerfully consider how you'll be part of God's exciting mission through the hands of your congregation. Also next week, Sunday, March 7th, we will be together again in person. So be sure if that's something you'd like to do that you go onto our website and register. Please be sure to read our covenant of care for the time that we'll be together. There are many opportunities for you to connect and be with Christ the King. One is a Bible study that takes place on Monday. Another is that summer has online opportunities for children to gather at 11 o'clock via Zoom. And there's also some great online material. So check that out. Also check out summer's very um, interesting message. It's called Not Your Boring Bible. So everyone is sure to learn something through that. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you.